In September 1978, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin arrived in the US on the invite of the American President Jimmy Carter. Nine months had passed since the breakdown in talks between the Egyptians and the Israelis. The relative isolation of the presidential resort of Camp David in Maryland was an ideal location for the talks. Camp David was a brilliant exercise of uh, President Carter. He understood the differences between Begin and Sadat. Uh, and he understood that those negotiations can go on and on and on and never be uh, concluded. So he uh, wanted to put the two leaders into a pressure cooker. Uh, they will be separated there from the media, from the political environment. They will be able to focus uh, on the issues of the peace treaty itself. But the talks got off to a bad start when Sadat laid out his peace plan to Carter and Begin. What happened, in fact, is that he at Camp David met Begin once and he presented an Egyptian proposal that Begin rejected and there was a, some sort of a shouting match in such a way that President uh, Carter decided that uh, they should not meet again. Seeking to avoid any further unpleasant encounters, Carter and his team kept the two delegations apart and worked with each one separately. President Carter for Unexplained reasons, I don't understand until this very day, he decided to separate each other, each from other, as if he was thinking that they can make war. Sadat stuck to his demand for a comprehensive peace agreement that included withdrawal from occupied Arab territories and recognition of Palestinian rights. Begin refused to be drawn on these issues and instead stayed fixated specifically on the issue of an Israeli withdrawal from Sinai. Objectively, Sadat had the weakest hand. I mean, Begin had the territory. You know, Begin had what the others wanted. And he could always say no, at least to the Egyptians, and he could say no to us and challenge us to try to force him to make the concessions. The leaders remained locked away in Camp David. After a week, they emerged when Carter took them on an outing to the nearby Gettysburg War Memorial. The hallowed ground of the American Civil War battlefield may have provided a sobering lesson on the cost of conflict. But the deadlock remained when they returned to Camp David. On the Egyptian side, Sadat was the most accommodating member of the Egyptian delegation with a vision of peace that was strategic, whereas much of the delegation was seemingly more tough-minded, but basically more preoccupied with short-range specifics. On the Israeli side, it was almost the opposite. Begin was by far the most rigid, the most unyielding, whereas some of the people around him were much more flexible. With the American mediators going between the Egyptians and Israelis, the talks dragged on. Begin followed a very devious policy, procrastinating, procrastinating, time, 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 time. Till the last moment, Begin didn't want to commit himself with respect to settlement in Sinai and so on. So uh, he was dragging his feet and Prince Sadat was under pressure. Feeling this strain, on the 10th day, Sadat decided to terminate the discussions and return home. So Carter went to see him and uh, he said, well, what's happening? Well, why are you planning to leave? And he said, I, I can't stay, I can't deal with these people, they're impossible, and so forth. And uh, Carter says, you can't leave. He says, well, why not? He says, you can't leave because if you leave, it's the end of the U.S.-Egyptian relationship, and it's the end of our personal relationship. This was detention diplomacy. Neither side was allowed to leave before an agreement had been reached. After two weeks of talks and under intense American pressure, Sadat and Begin finally reached an accord. 
The first part of the Camp David Accords provided a vague framework for a Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The second part of the Accords outlined a basis for the signing of a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. The treaty would stipulate Israel's full withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula, the establishment of diplomatic relations, and the guarantee of free passage of Israeli ships through the Suez Canal and other international waterways. The Accords put a restriction on Egypt's stationing of forces in the Sinai. The most sensitive issue of all, the status of Jerusalem, was deemed too controversial and was excluded from the Accords. Some of Sadat's own delegation were unhappy with the draft of the final agreement. We were not happy. We were not happy. We thought that we could get better, a better deal. Not that we, were, we didn't want a deal, but we thought we could get a better deal. So the, a president of a republic, any republic in the world, has to take certain decisions. He took certain decisions. We cannot afford... Egyptian Foreign Minister Mohammed Ibrahim Kamel resigned at Camp David. He felt Sadat had surrendered on essential points relating to the West Bank and Gaza and had left Egypt isolated in the Arab world. It was a big emotional trauma for Mohammed Ibrahim Kamel. Mohammed Ibrahim Kamel belongs to this generation of Egyptians who were brought up uh, by the ideas of the National Party, Hezb Atmosphere. Kamel was the second Egyptian foreign minister in less than a year to quit in protest at Sadat's dealings with Israel. Despite the resignation, Sadat and Begin signed the Camp David Accords at a ceremony held in the White House on September the 17th, 1978. I was glad when Camp David was over that at least we got the Egyptians ready. But I did not celebrate. I mean, I, in all honesty, I thought the other part, it's not going to work. I mean, as people read the fine print, Palestinians won't buy it, the other Arabs won't buy it, we're going to have a split in the Arab world. The split was not slow in coming. People throughout the Arab world denounced the bilateral deal Sadat struck with Israel. Those at the heart of the region's problem, Palestinians in refugee camps and in the occupied territories, were outraged. They felt Sadat had weakened the chances of Israeli withdrawal from other Arab territories. Camp David's uh, resolution were a great disappointment to us Palestinians here. Because the outcome was only Sadat got his Sinai agreement, total withdrawal from there, but yet the West Bank stays as it is, under occupation. Regardless of Arab anger, Sadat returned to the White House in March 1979 to formally sign the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty with Begin. Israel exploded. People danced in the streets, celebrating the peace treaty with its largest Arab neighbor. In Egypt, Sadat returned to a hero's welcome. Sadat was a gambler with a grand sweep of history in his outlook and rhetoric, uh, willing to take chances. He took an enormous gamble in signing the peace treaty with Israel, but he got what he fundamentally wanted, which was all of Sinai, without any residual Israeli presence. Begin was also a man with a vision and a toughness, but ultimately also willing to cut the Gordon knot. He concluded in the end that breaking the Arab phalanx around Israel was worth the price of giving up all of Sinai. The Israelis implemented the first stage of the agreed phased withdrawal. In May 1979, after 12 years of Israeli occupation, Egypt regained El Arish, the largest city in Sinai. Sadat raised the flag over the liberated city, making a big event of regaining Egyptian land. 
The celebration was perhaps a message to other Arab leaders that gaining land for peace with Israel was a viable option. But whereas the Egyptians celebrated, doubts remained over whether the rest of the Arab world would follow Egypt's lead. The Greek island of Rhodes. The first ever negotiations between the Egyptians and the Israelis took place here in January 1949. In the wake of the first Arab-Israeli war, military delegates from both countries met inside this hotel under the supervision of the United Nations. And the Egypt-Israel armistice is signed. On February the 24th, the Egyptians and Israelis reached an agreement on the ceasefire lines between their forces. Once Egypt had made the deal, the three other Arab countries neighboring Israel, Lebanon, Jordan and Syria, also concluded deals with the Israelis. Thirty years later, the peace treaty signed between Egypt and Israel invited other Arab countries to follow the Egyptian lead. In reality, the Arab world was enraged by Egypt's initiative. In November 1978, six weeks after the signing of the Camp David Accords, Arab leaders meeting in Baghdad in the absence of Egypt denounced the Accords. We are against it and we will face it with all our means. Egypt was expelled from the Arab League once the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty was formally signed in 1979. The organization's headquarters was moved from Cairo to Tunis. That was a very sad thing. Again, because we were not able to agree to disagree with the Arab countries. They thought we were abandoning them. And we thought they did not understand us. As the strongest Arab country, Egypt had always been the Arab center and the biggest threat to Israel. This war memorial in Ashdod in Israel, just 30 kilometers from Tel Aviv, marks the point to which the Egyptian army advanced in the 1948 war. It's a testament to the threat Egypt posed to Israel. The Zionists were always aware of the region's biggest power, Egypt. They had to take it out, neutralize it from the military and political equation. In 1979, Israel achieved by peace what it had failed to achieve in war. Israel gained a huge advantage. The main Egyptian army was taken out of the conflict. The main threat to Israeli borders disappeared. One of my colleagues was the general of the Israeli army. He immediately after the, after the peace with Egypt, he said, now we can disband several Israeli army divisions. This did not happen. Israeli army did not become smaller, it became bigger. With Egypt removed from the circle of war, Israel could feel free to act on other fronts. In March 1978, Israel invaded South Lebanon to destroy bases belonging to Palestinian fighters. In June 1981, Israeli jets bombed an Iraqi nuclear reactor near Baghdad. A year later, the Israelis invaded Lebanon a second time, advancing up to the capital, Beirut. Egypt was no longer the axis of the Arab cause. The great Muslim leader Salah al-Din said, there is no victory without Egypt. So when Egypt rises, as it did under Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser since 1955, it lifts the whole Arab world up with it. And similarly, when Sadat dragged Egypt into his infamous treaty, he dragged the whole Arab world down with him. Prior to his death in 1970, Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser had been the champion of pan-Arabism. He'd always been a towering foe in Israel's eyes. His successor was always going to have a tough time living up to the legend. Sadat would have loved to have been another Nasser. 
but he realized at some point it was impossible. He had no following in the rest of the Arab world, and perhaps his own feelings were stronger about just if, it, if all I can get is something for Egypt, I'll do just Egypt. Uh, but he also started wanting to get the whole thing solved. Despite widespread Arab hostility, negotiations between the Egyptians and Israelis resumed in May 1979. It is our joint responsibility. The talks were to focus on the thorny issue of Palestinian autonomy, which had been vaguely defined in the Camp David Accords. For the Egyptians, these talks represented one last chance to mitigate Arab hostility by securing meaningful rights for the Palestinians. The Egyptian delegation had serious proposals and fought seriously for very important things, for the, the, the concept of autonomy, full autonomy. What would full autonomy mean? Of course the Israelis didn't want these negotiations to lead anywhere. Begin's appointment of Yusef Berg to head Israel's negotiating team was a clear sign of his strategy. Berg was the Minister of Interior and leader of the National Religious Party, which advocated Israel's hold over Jerusalem and supported settlements in the West Bank. What I must make clear and what must be understood from the outset is that autonomy does not and cannot imply sovereignty. If it is peace and welfare of people that we seek, then we must, by definition, reject a priori an independent Palestinian status. After 10 rounds of negotiations, there was no agreement. The Israelis insisted on a military presence in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, offering only a very limited civilian autonomy to the Palestinians. Meanwhile, there was a dramatic increase in the construction of Jewish settlements, illegal under international law. And in 1980, the Knesset announced an undivided Jerusalem as the eternal capital of Israel, a blow to Sadat's efforts at regaining a part of the holy city. Shortly afterwards, Egypt suspended the autonomy negotiations. Jerusalem is very sensitive for the Israelis. It is much more sensitive for a hundred million Muslims. To us, much more sacred than the willing war to the Israelis. But to this day, many Egyptians still believe Sadat had no choice but to reach a separate peace with Israel. Of course, a separate treaty. Of course, it was a bilateral deal. Practically speaking, all deals are bilateral. Marriage is bilateral, and so is divorce. The mood on the Egyptian streets was always an important factor in Sadat's mind. In January 1977, 10 months prior to his historic visit to Jerusalem, rioting had erupted in Egypt after Sadat announced an end to government subsidies on basic foodstuffs. The rioting provided a harsh reminder that the primary concern of Egyptians is not politics, but their daily bread. Sadat exploited these economic concerns to sell the peace accord with Israel to his people. The media propagated the idea that the peace deal with Israel would be the way to improve living conditions, especially given there were so many chronic problems, such as housing, transportation, unemployment and poverty. And America would pay the bill for solving all these problems and would also provide subsidies in place of the Arab financial aid that had been stopped. The message was clear. Egypt had sacrificed enough for the Arab cause of Palestine. It was now time for Egypt to make its own peace, solve its own problems, and regain its own land. What is more important, that we get rid of this kind of obsession, that we, the Palestinian problem is the most important problem in our life. So the peace agreement was very positive then it helps us to get rid of this obsession and to pay attention to other problems and to pay attention to our internal problems. But not everyone in Egypt was won over by Sadat's message and his peace treaty with Israel. 
بصفة عامة كل القوى All Islamic groups, whoever they were, expressed the rejection of the idea of peace with Israel. There were sheikhs in mosques denouncing President Sadat. There were demonstrations in the universities. And there was other opposition groups and their publications. Sadat was fated in the West as a peacemaker. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize along with Menachem Begin. While praise was lavished on him abroad, opposition at home intensified. Sadat became increasingly irritated by this criticism. In 1981, President Sadat did not hesitate insulting all his opponents. He spared no one, from the church to the mosque, to the Muslim Brotherhood, to the Nasserites, the liberals and the leftists. He accused them of treason and threw them in jail. On one night in September 1981, hundreds of people were arrested in a large-scale sweep. It is a purge, and uh, I'm not uh, eliminating the uh, opposition like uh, some of you have seen. The crackdown proved to be a desperate attempt to quell the growing voice of dissent. On the 6th of October 1981, Sadat would pay the ultimate price for his peace treaty with Israel. Yes, it's a, it's a risk to make peace in the Middle East. It's a dangerous profession, because the emotions are so high, and emotions always lead towards war, not towards peace. Islamist militants assassinated Sadat at a military parade celebrating the 8th anniversary of the 1973 October War. Would Sadat's vision of peace between Egypt and Israel expire with him? Amid the turbulence of the region, the years to come were to prove a testing time for the Egyptian-Israeli peace.